reason. All right, we're now recording. Okay, so the meeting is open. Um, there's no minutes, right? Cindy has them. Okay, and we can't vote on a continuation because we don't have a quorum. We don't have a quorum. So, so um, what to do then? Fault by default? Uh, if she's willing, I don't think it really matters, matters. but I'll okay. double check. Okay. Okay. So um, the other thing on the agenda is the um, presentation from Audubon, uh, representing Audubon um, for a request to hold a CR on the Chapin Road uh, property at 119 Chapin, which was the old Moran property. Um, we have a very preliminary uh, CR just to kind of explain um, the likely uh, requirements and issues. And we have some maps and um, a lot of questions. So we're not so much here to discuss the details of the CR. I just want to explain to people who watch this later, because 12 will. Um, but just as one way of clarifying what our responsibility would be um, if we took this on. Um, okay, so. <laughs> Thank you very much for- You want one of the maps? Yes, I would love to have a map up there, yes. Appreciate your considerateness. Oh, you know, Jennifer was gonna try to watch, so you should look for her to show up. Okay. She's the um, new vice president of the land trust. She, Sherry, after, I don't know how many years, 20s, 30, 30 anyway. um, has stepped down as president. And um, now the Hamden head person is uh, the vice president. That's Jennifer. And I'm here, Judy. President. If you can hear me. I don't know if you can hear me. Who's that? Hi, Judy. Jen Baggy's here. Oh, hi. Okay. Hi. I'm here. <laughs> and what's the other one? This one? No, that's not as good. Use the other. That was. Use the other one. That's a different property. The, the slides. That was um, the yeah, the slides. Yeah, Use the slides. slides. Do I have the wrong one? Oh no. Oh no. No. Nope. Send no. Uh, let me go back. I probably loaded. It's okay, the don't worry about it. Oh, I got them. I just got to find it. Hold on. Bedrock? Yeah. There we are. We got three different projects on Chapin, so. That so you one? really want the big slide project, don't you? Is this it? We do, but we could start with this. Okay. This is my first slide. Anyway, just to give you an overview of where this property is and the history of it. Um, and as you mentioned, it was the former Moran property, which came up for sale a few years ago. Um, and we were unsuccessful in acquiring the whole thing. Um, so Bedrock Financial, uh, the person of Al Joyce, is who purchased the property. And once he had closed on it, I contacted him again and asked if we could work something out on the back. Because I knew what he really wanted were frontage lots to build houses. So he was open to that. Um, he wanted us to buy it and wasn't prepared to give it to us. And I said, well, we have got potential grants to do that with. Um, so we entered into a contract with him subject to our finding the money to purchase the property. Um, so he entered the, the box turtle. This property is apparently prime habitat for box turtles who are a species of concern. Learned a little bit more about box turtles. We have a lot in Hamden. They're, they're our main thing that shows up. And they apparently like to stay in one place for most of their lives and they don't like being relocated. And if we do, they try to get home. And if they're too far away, they'll probably get killed in the process. So it's a good thing to have this property be preserved, assuming they're there, other turtles and things are there. So that's how we've come to purchase what's turned out to be 64 acres, uh, that proposed fee section. 
of this former Marina property. The proposed CR is 11 acres that, that Rock Financial is required to preserve um, in connection with his development of the lots along the road. Because the entire property, as you probably have, is all subject to natural heritage and endangered species. Now, why aren't the two pieces as one? Because, because of different programs working together. So the 11 acres is a mitigation that he's required to do because of his development. Even though he's getting rid of the rest of the 60 yeah. acres. So the, yeah, the mitigation- okay, That's what I found confusing. So why is it- The mitigation just makes up for the land that that's turtle habitat that they're actually using, that okay. they're intruding on essentially. Okay. Right. And the rest of it, I think he he long term thought he might be able to develop it and realized he wasn't going to be able to. Um, so it's not part of the mitigation land; it's just part of what's going to be conserved. But mitigation property, as you find out from Westbrook, has a lot of extra limits on it. Like you can't do all sorts of things, like move trails around, or things that you can do on other properties. So, on that 11 acres. Okay. So we're gonna have a hand in that 11 acres. So you're buying outright the piece called proposed fee. Correct. We are buying it outright. Then why can't you buy the other one? Because it's gotta be attached to the development. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Has to be. So there's just, I guess a little clarification on your notes here. We are gonna be buying it with grants through the Nature Conservancy, which is a box turtle mitigation that grant, and a, and a grant from the country Fish and Wildlife, it's called the Inlu Fee Program. So that's also mitigation money that's coming through Department of Fish and Fish and Wildlife. So those two grants are working, will hopefully get both of them. We've got the TMC one, we're still waiting to hear on the ILF one. Um, that and some fundraising, then we have the funds to go forward and buy it. We just had it surveyed, we had the title work done. Um, there's no hazardous things on it that we could find. So basically, we're working to do both, both those grant orders, those grant sources, require that we have a conservation restriction on the 64 acres. We wonder why we need that. I thought about it, not even to sell it or put it in soccer fields, but it's just an extra layer of protection. And actually, Mass Audubon asks for that in other situations from other landowners. It's just an extra layer. And then, so both Fish and Wildlife and TNC want a CR. And we can't hold the CR ourselves because the CR is a document that's sort of enforcing protection and perpetuity of the property. So it's really just, why the land trust exists because the town can't hold its own. Right, sales. right, right, it's the right. Same kind of thing. Yeah. So con town conservation commissions do hold CRs for not for land trusts. We had I just recently completed a project in Warwick where the town conservation is holding several CRs. They're only holding one of those CRs by themselves. The other ones they're holding as co-holders with either Mount Grace or with Miss Audubon. Um, we have a lot of oversight um, in combination with um, the land trust over a lot of CRs, but in truth, the land trust does 90% of the stewardship and that sort of thing. We just oversee issues that arise um, or reports that people send in. So um, only very recently, we took on three small mitigation parcels that were the, this kind of thing where the, something was being developed and a piece was set aside and they had to, um, the town got the mitigation land, but they asked us to hold the CR, but it's a very new thing for the commission itself to be directly um, holding a CR. That's why there's a lot of questions. Um. 
I, we're not going to go through the CR unless you really want to, but I can just say that one of the requirements of the ILF funding is that we not start putting trails all over the place. If we were to do that, we would have to survey them all and exclude them from the grant. So, and it's, so it's just not something we want to do here either. Um, it's possible to walk around on the property without having trails. Um, that are sort of creating trails. Are you putting trails on your end, on your piece? No. no. I mean, that's None I of it. Not You're not, any of it's going to have, none of it's going to have it. Right. Okay. There may be restoration at some point in the future. That's a permitted use in the conservation description. Invasive species, there's a lot of new animals there. Burning bush, a lot of burning bush. My favorite plant, yeah. Um, so next to barberry like maintenance and restoration that we might do and we could have passive recreation walk around on the so you're planning on let, letting people access it to walk around on yeah do you have a, a a way to cross from the main property over to your second piece or you have to walk through the brook the current area that's in blue is across the scanic do you do you i can't remember from back then do you have a bridge or do people have to walk through the Scanted to get to that piece, and thus, fun. and thus to the new piece. Yeah. Because that's the only access, or not? It shows it going up to Chapin, but I don't know if there's an actual access there. That's right. Yeah. Chapin Road, that southern boundary, what doesn't show on this map is the pipeline. There's oh, okay. Big yeah. Okay. And so, and it's so that you can pull off and actually walk up in there. There's not really any parking area, but you can. Yeah, well, yeah, that's what I was getting. You know, parking area. Are you, you how are you going to let people on there or not let people on? That's not under my purview, but purview. I would say from what I know and talk to people who think about those things, that it's um, not going to be something that's happening in the near future. There won't. I don't think there'll be parking. I don't think we're going to like install a parking lot to start having trails there because. Whether you say there's no trails or whatever, <laughs> if it's open, recreational, accessible land, people will find a way, yeah. especially those with dogs or horses. They're going to find a way. You know? Well, horseback <laughs> is not allowed here under the, I did look that up. No horses allowed? No horses. Okay. So we, have, we don't allow dogs or horses. Yeah. Maybe because they're, but, they're feet, you know, tender. Yeah. Well, I, I have protected area in back of me and they don't have horses because there's too many houses, but no motorized vehicles. Ha ha ha. They're out there yeah, all the ATVs time. These are always hard. That, you know, so all over the, the point is, is people will force the issue. So that's yeah. why I'm asking them. The, yep. Yeah, that's why I'm asking It's the more questions. advantage actually than not putting in trails. It makes yeah. it harder. Well, yeah, but don't make trails. So. Is this, is this the entire, um, the part, the partial, was originally owned by Al Joyce, or he bought it, correct? Bought it. Yeah. Family. Now I I see where he has the planned seven house lots on on Chapin. Is does he once this goes through, he can't he cannot build beyond that, correct? Or what? I don't think so. No. I don't think well, because they're buying it. So they're going to own it. So he would be building on right. the mitigation land or the property. So that's the whole more the old more. Yes. The whole yes, property it is right there. The way it's going. And uh, that that divot right in the middle of it that goes from Chapin out, yeah. that's the estate lot. That's one big giant estate lot. And then there's three on each side along the edge. And then the next thing over on the north end is that triangular piece we committed a couple of years ago where they put two parcels together and built the house mm -hmm. on it. That's also- And, what, um, and there's, there must be a house down on the little- That was a house that was already there. There. And it just isn't part of the parcel. Oh, okay. And the big divot in the back goes all the way across to um, Scantic Road and is the old Smith property where Pat Smith used to live. Now it's- Oh, really? That goes that far? Yeah, it's a really deep property. Deep. It belongs to a um, guy named, starts with a B now, but they sold it. Oh. Because I tried to get the back part of that too. 
So if you want to go to the other slides, um, Nicole was just trying to. So make there, I pick the one that's eight thousand because he's got them all yeah. the stuff. Which one? The one that says eight thousand KD. Eight thousand. Right here. So when you want. Are they just wooden stakes or did you put in something a little more? You put in, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wooden stakes are too easy to disappear. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
some of our properties that I go out and monitor, there's really no boundary monuments and it can get quite confusing. So in this case, it's super helpful to have to be able to know exactly where those properties are. And who's responsible for putting in the boundary markers? My solid one. My solid one. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we have um we have specific uh, 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 guidance for putting in boundary markers um on conservation land. That's a different kind of boundary. Um, they're talking about the surveyed boundary as opposed to right. we have boundary markers for the beginning of the wetlands usually. Oh. Is yeah, it, but I'm just wondering if the same type of a boundary marker could be used in this case because you want to be able to you want to be able to identify where the um, the CR property is. Mm -hmm. And if and if we had those permanent, we have permanent markers, and you have to find them um, where um, GIS. Is yeah. yeah. So after the, yeah. the surveyor put things in, makes them easier. Into the GPS coordination, so then at least you put your cell phone, take yourself within about ten feet of them. Yeah. So that's what we usually require on our wetland markings. I have, I have a bunch. Yes, where they are. Sorry. In case someone I'll decides, give you a copy. Hey, nobody's looking. I want to extend my. Yeah, copy. but. This is all conservation lands. Why don't you let it out, get ourselves Well, why wouldn't you have? Why wouldn't? And why wouldn't you have them where all the? Uh, they've got iron pins at every single corner. Yeah, but, well, see, it, why were you where you have the house lots? Yeah. Homeowners are notorious for intruding. Yeah. So why won't you at least have permanent markers where all the houses are? Talk to them. Don't yeah. Yeah, we typically try to have flag on them too or spray paint. I'm just going to add that. Yeah. But if for any reason that those um, survey boundaries work, GIS or GPS, certainly go out there and got those points. Well, one of the things we're talking about is permanent markers. Along here where all the house lots are, because homeowners yes. are notorious for okay. mowing the extra foot this year and three feet next year and cutting that tree. Yes. And next thing you know, the houses are, are pushed back. Are pushed back. I guess that's what I heard from you guys where we, we would survey the property with you. And if someone had done that, that <laughs> Force them back to their yeah. Yeah. original land. And yeah. Just like when we hire a consultant to do the laundry at the land trust. And then he writes out this whole report, and then it's up to us are we going to go try to fix it ourselves? Are we going to pursue it with the landowner? Is it, you know? Yeah, so this they would be the equivalent now of the landowner. They're going to own that whole proposed fee yeah. part. You weren't here when they first started, but. The mitigation property is the proposed CR property. That means the proposed CR that they're going to hold for the mitigation. Then the back piece is what they're asking us to hold the CR for because they're going to own the property. So I don't see any purpose in having wetlands boundary markers because the whole thing is going to be under conservation. Um, what I think is worth thinking about is how many boundary markers um, are there? Because it is true that we've, significant, we've had significant trouble with people pushing their property back. They mow, they dump grass, they, you know. Cut trees. And one guy moved an entire chicken house, play yard. <laughs> into the, do. yeah. He said, that don't count. That's yeah, not a like, house. It's just things. Well, yeah. your things count. Um, so we get nervous. Yes. Yeah. So anyhow, the whole point is, is, are your little markers sufficient enough so as a deterrent to the homeowner, or do we always ask you to do something more intrusive, obvious that says no, no? But yeah. on our end, if we're actually checking this out. If someone did come into it, it's their responsibility right. to push them back. So, yeah. I mean, if they're, I feel if they feel comfortable enough. And we're going out there and we can, I like the GPS because then we can at least walk yeah, pin to pin to pin. You're not walking through the woods thinking, who, you know, who am I on? At least go pin to pin and see something in that problem, in that process of there. 
you make a note and they have to go. It's a but, nice piece for us. We just tell them they have to know, fix it. We're probably a ways yet from getting to that point, but yeah, something to think about. Right. All right. Let me go back to where we were. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No. That's why we're here. Yeah. Was it this one? On the next one. There we go. Great. So, um, kind of talked about like the annual planning for the modern visit, and then actually getting out into the field to do the visit um, itself. So really critical that whoever's doing the monitoring beforehand to review the baseline justification report as well as the CR language before going out to monitor just so that it's in the back of their mind what the prohibited and permitted activities are on the property so that you do see something you can kind of have a red flag come up like okay this is not allowed here of course if I'm allowed here it's state law enforcement kind of thing um and then just reaching out to Mount Audubon as the landowners, asking whether or not there's any changes to the property, are there any proposed changes? And as Kate said, we're pretty far off from really doing that. And we really see this as being a conservation piece and not wanting to really have to navigate and you know, develop the trails and things like that. So when you're out in the field, it's really about recording your observations that you see on the property. Um, when I go out in the field, and I know everyone has different types of technologies, um, we have a tablet that has an app that can have the CR, and I can put a Bluetooth GPS to it that will show my tracks of exactly where I walk. Um, sometimes it gets a little off in terms of like my GPS location, I might be about 15 feet off from where it's actually showing on the map, but it's very helpful to know, right, like you were saying, where those um, boundaries are for the property itself. And then it's a great reference point in the monitoring report to know exactly where you walked by being able to see those tracks afterwards. Um, it's really important to keep photos out of the site visit, so taking photos of any of the potential issues that you see. Um, I think what's also really great is to consider developing maybe spaces within the property that turn into kind of a tangible photo point that might just highlight the property itself as the overall tax acquisition. That can be really helpful and useful if you're taking photos year after year to say, oh my goodness, wow, like we used to have a really great tree canopy here. And now we're noticing that all the hemlocks are dying back. Like maybe this is a sign for us to let that bottom run know. Hey, you might want to consider planting some more native trees in there so that the forest is going to regenerate. Or maybe we notice that there was just a small patch of burning bush, and then you come out the next year and it's grown infinitely in size. So that can be really helpful to kind of capture those things as well, but also capturing interesting dumping happening on the property. I would say that's really kind of the biggest thing that we see. Uh, thinking about focusing on the areas of the property that are considered high risk. And really what that means is, are there abutters? So thinking about that planned house lot, part of that Western boundary of um, the potential CR would border with those houses. And like you were all saying, it can lead to a lot of people dumping their yard waste, maybe mowing a little bit and trying to extend their lawn, maybe building a tree house out there. Um, those tend to be our highest risk areas. So whenever I go out to visit, if I have a property that has neighbors, that will kind of be the first line that I walk to see. Um, and then going and walking other boundaries if I permits. Versus having to go out and romp through the wetlands over here, um, knowing that much of that eastern boundary is pretty wet of this property. So not saying that it's a requirement that you do that year after year, but maybe making a note that every three years we'll go out to that boundary line just to see how things are looking out there. Um, but really kind of focusing on those areas where it's about going where the people go, really. Um, if you see a social trail, follow it, see where maybe that goes. Maybe there's a campsite out there that um, someone has been utilizing, taking photos and documenting that might be that as well. And then just checking in with Mass Audubon too. Um, you mentioned this before, this before the visit, if we aren't able to attend for any reason, the hope is that we would be there so that we can see everything firsthand and noting that we'll be holding the CR west of this property, that it could be a great time to get out together since we'll be sharing the boundary line um, and kind of making some set of that site visit. And the next slide uh, is just focused on kind of some of the pieces you want to make sure to include in the monitoring reports themselves. So as I mentioned, any pertinent information that was discussed with the landowner, if 
Mass Audubon happened to say, hey, we're thinking about putting in an educational kiosk at the Southern Boundary Line, um, putting a note there so that when you see it pop up the next year, you maybe aren't surprised and cut spare. So someone has that reference point or noting that maybe we need to follow up with Mass Audubon to get more information about this. Discussing any of the relevant areas of the property that you cover. So sometimes using different applications and GPS can be really helpful to show, like I was saying, maybe tracking where exactly you walked and creating a map that can show that and feel like that. Or just really going into detail and discussing started at the southern boundary line, walked east, hit the river, continued north, just so we can kind of have a picture of where exactly on the property was covered during the visit. Noting overall property conditions, if things are looking healthy in the forest, if you see any wildlife, just important things to note that um, can kind of tell the larger story of how um, the overall property is in terms of health. Of course, issues that are encountered, that's a big one to document, but kind of just like the primary one to document, um, take the photos. There's some really great apps out there that you can have on your phone or on a tablet that you can take a photo and actually will have the lat long information on the photo itself. Um, this picture here I took at a recent monitoring visit where I noticed there was a tree stand for hunting on the property and um, there wasn't hunting allowed. So I was able to show this image to the landowner. They can have the information exactly at where it is on the property. We take waypoints as well that have the GPS location attached. So we can see on the map exactly where those issues lay. Um, and just so that they can have more information to kind of be able to follow up accordingly. And what's great too about having kind of a map where you might have waypoints of um, photos of issues and things like that is that it's really great to reference for next year's monitoring visit of uh, saying, oh, here I see there was a photo point in the southern west corner of the property and someone was dumping their yard waste. Let's go and check out that area again on this year's monitoring visit to see if they dealt with it or not. And if not, we'll follow up with that thought on accordingly. And then just really notifying if there's like any commercial changes to the property, maybe in that wet area, there's some great beaver activity that's happening. We noticed that part of the forest is now floodplain zone. Um, but of course, any man-made changes to ATV use is really a big one. I totally understand that. I think especially with like a transmission corridor there, that can be difficult, but something to consider for Mass Audubon in terms of signage, um, maybe limiting access in one way or another in terms of a gate or something if we're noticing people are really entering one portion of the property um, through an ATV trail. Noticing if there's any public use that's prohibited on the property. Um, and yeah, just labeling photos, capturing those issues all in all. So the monitoring reports itself can be as robust as you'd like, but hitting on these primary points are really important and help guide the process and having Mass Audubon know what's really happening on the property, guiding you all in terms of your future monitoring visits so that you can really know what areas are important to visit be. Um, I think this case is unique in terms of Mass Audubon being the landowner, where we're very conservation minded. Um, a lot of the CRs that I monitor are private homeowners, so it's a different case where someone might have a really big dream of what they want to do for their home and their space, and it might not fit into what's allowed within the CR. So that can be difficult. But in this case, Mass Audubon wants to see those lands conserved. Like Kate said, we're not looking to put in soccer fields or build an amusement park or something. So we're not here to be a headache. We want to be a really beneficial partner and just seeing more space conserved in Camden. So I think this could be a really awesome opportunity for you all. And really that's all the information that I have. This last slide um, has both mine and Kate's email addresses. If um, you're hoping to follow up, if you have any additional questions that come to mind in the middle of the night or something like that. No. Both so we're really happy to help clarify and answer questions while we're here now too. When you walked it, did, did you see much intrusion by man, hunting stands or or quad trails or anything like that out there? No, no, actually we didn't. I think one deterrent is that it's pretty wet. Yeah, it's very wet. I have several people have um, mentioned that they, since they were a kid, the the home the the landowner was very. Um, 
open to people, kids wandering back there, digging around looking for old bottles, that kind of stuff. And some of them mentioned that they have hunted there. So one of my questions was, I noticed the CR doesn't, doesn't uh, eliminate hunting. Um, is that something you're planning on allowing on the land? We're still talking about hunting in advance auto markets. Traditionally, it has not been an allowed um, activity or permitted activity on wildlife sanctuaries. Well, public yes. land in Hamden, you can't hunt, but you can hunt anywhere that you get a permit from a private landowner. So you're kind of half of that. <laughs> you're, you're more, you're the private landowner essentially. So um, it would be up to you whether you would want to permit it or not, I think. Um, because it's not, it won't be public land. There's an evolution of thinking happening. Yeah, there's a lot of differences on it. And, you know, a lot of people in town are used to hunting um, and they do find places to hunt, but you just can't do it on the, the places where people walk mostly because our, our public land is very heavily used. So that's still up in the air. Um, and it sounded like um, it would be our responsibility to create the BDR as well. Could be. We could help with that. I mean, we have experience doing that. We've also known um, a couple of different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the land trust does have people that they have used. So um, I suspect that they would be willing to do it as well. We could use some of our, you remember we're getting some mitigation funds, so we could use some of our mitigation funds, for instance, for doing that or um, from this, there's funds that come with it as well. Or, the annual, that um, or the land trust doesn't usually or, pay for annual ones, they pay for every third year. So maybe um, if it was, say, the person I'm used to them using, the pay for one every three years and then the land trust folks trail along or and or go in the years in between so that they know where to go and what to look for. Because I'm kind of, I know we would be older than Yeah. We're all volunteers. Yeah, I, I think it would be too expensive to pay for every year. It usually costs about, well, for, um, Depending on the size of the property, but anywhere from like three hundred to five or six hundred dollars. Because I'm looking over there at so, Mr. Schleckman. If if even if they went along with this, what's it going to cost us? Especially if we don't have someone that's going to be able to do all the paperwork. Yeah. And we have to hire out. Well, uh, there are stewardship extra. funds that do come right, with this. Right. But they, but they wouldn't they wouldn't be enough to <clears throat> do it to pay for it every year. So I think um, you might pay for it every third year and fill in with our personnel in between or something like that. You know, do it like a site visit. Yeah, every, every, every. Things like that, we could do the, the walking piece of this, but yeah. I don't have time to sit yeah. down and put it all together. Okay. He does yeah. have a question. Are you, are you asking about what we have so much to do this? They have work there? No, we have, no, the yeah. land trust has somebody they use to do this, this monitoring part, but they don't, do it every year because it's too expensive. They do it every third year. Um, for this particular project, it would have to be every year, which um, there are some mitigation funds that are offered with this proposal, but it wouldn't be enough to do it every year. And my question is whether we have the time or the capability to do it, would we have to have a professional director? Yeah. Well, we're about to sign a, a shared Right, right, right. So that person would make it their job. Would 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 that person would probably be ideal if that that happens? But we've been down this road a few times and it hasn't happened, so <laughs> I'm not holding my breath yet. <laughs> yeah, it would be it would be perfect for a shared conservation. Yes, to yes. Yeah, and hopefully that person would come in with all the expertise to do this type of thing. Yeah. But if even if that happens, that may bear on what you pay that person, you know, what they're expected to do. Can I, can I, I, I'm just a part of the 
<laughs> yes. Um, go, can you go back? To yeah, I'll go. Thing? Hold on. I'll go back to that. Yeah, there's there's um the, the parcels that have been approved. There's also because they're in natural heritage, there's a mitigation parcel behind that, that little spotted parcel behind the stripe. And they're going to hold the CR for that. And then all that piece behind their purchasing fee of uh, fee purchase. Okay. And they would like us that the proposal here is that we would hold the CR because obviously if you own it, you can't hold the CR. Right. That makes us responsible for doing the monitoring. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Even though they're uh, an environmental society, they can't do their own checking per se. Yeah. So if somebody still has somebody else has to oversee them, if you will. And I guess because of the certain agencies that it is, instead of the three years we're used to, it has to be every year, right? And then, and then there's, I think so. It doesn't require you to monitor every year. I think that I that came out of my mouth because for Mass Audubon for the CRs that we hold in order to hold our land request accreditation, we should have to monitor it. Yeah, I see. So I think that I would have to look at the CR again, but there's potential that it could be every year. So we might be able to pay for a good one, so to speak, every three years and then go and do a site visit, wander around the property, yeah. look for stuff every so alternate on um, the alternate every years. Year, yeah. year and a half to see if anything. And then if there are issues, certainly one of us could write up a, a report and send it in. Totally. Yeah. And, I, and I'll say too, you know, the reporting itself really varies depending on like whoever's writing it, their style. Like I looked at some old monitoring reports and they're super quick, you know, like no changes, no issues, check, check, check. And then it's not very helpful. <laughs> yeah, right. And then but you know, but that also can suffice too. Yeah in that way. And I know that it varies from land trust to land trust as well in terms of like some that are volunteer run might not have the tablet and the PDF that I use for mine. So we might create a might checklist of some sort that people right. could just take out. With One of our big problems is is how well do we uh, are the seven house lots staying within their boundaries? Do we so, how well do we have to monitor them? Fortunately, because of the medication property, that's she's the one that's going to have to check most of those. Yeah. Well, there's, there's some part, that aren't. Yeah. There's one little part there that two two lots will have lots. pieces that yeah. have backyards. So no, three lots. I'm sorry. Three, three lots. Three lots so. will have pieces you know, that stick out. And if I'm out there every year monitoring that portion, I can also have that open you all to say, hey, wow, we had a lot of X Y Z happening behind houses. This likely could be impacting your western boundary line here, just to give you like that heads up. If it is one of those off years where maybe you aren't doing yeah. a robust monitoring. Mm -hmm. like that. So, and this is one of the things we're going to definitely have to pass to legal. Yeah. So, what but, happens if, if uh, <clears throat> the commission goes out and they, they do a site inspection and they find, you know, deer stands and other stuff and then they then what? I mean, how did, I mean, you certainly can't rip down somebody's deer stand. Or can you? <laughs> well, yeah, then we make the report. We That's our picture, job. And then, report. then we're responsible for it. And yeah. then you go out. Just <laughs> like if, just like when the land trust calls it a CR and they find something happening on a piece of land that's inappropriate, first they try to resolve it usually easily by calling the landowner and saying, um, did you know that your fence is like 20 feet into the wrong property? But if they can't, the first thing they then they go to the select board. And it's it's the select board's responsibility to deal with it. It's or legal. Or legal. Or whatever they, they decide. Have private you know. owners, just like mm -hmm. um, however, but it just it then it's into really the hierarchy yeah. and does its thing. Right. Yeah, sometimes it's the town inspector. Yeah. It's different people, but um it yeah. rarely gets put back on us. It's usually right. that we're just supposed to check it, find out what's there. I like that role when I'm out monitoring. The time. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of like, I'll point out the issues, but I'm glad that I don't have to be the one no. enforcing it. <laughs> hey, so you haven't. Um, you, ha you have 
gone to the planning board with this because you've already talked about the mitigation and stuff, I presume. We have not here the first. Oh, okay. So they're not, they're only aware of the actual parcels and nothing else? Or are they aware of nothing? <laughs> <laughs> We have great communication in this building. Um, okay, so that's my question is like, who else knows about this? Because this is our first meeting. Um, and and Don now knows about it. He's in the select board. And I'm sure that um, that will be the next thing that they're going to want to hear from you. This exact, exact same kind of presentation. What's there? Why? Um, and then, uh, and, and. Uh, clearly, they would sign the agreement for the CR because there are supervisors. The planning board is probably aware of the seven lots and the 11 acres. That's but not the rest. Not yeah. the rest. Is there a time frame on this? Mm -hmm. um, well, as soon as possible, but it's going to take a while to get the CR done and approved and signed. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say sometime between February and fall next year is sort of my goal. Don, does does you do you think planning board would need to know about this piece since it's outside of any building lots or not? Yeah, I think it's just going to go to the select board because they have. Yeah, they have the responsibility for overseeing us, and they have the responsibility for the CR if we take it on. So, um, I mean, they have their this it's their signature that's on. Huh? Not doing anything, right? You're not putting anything on anything. No, it's right. just going to be held essentially and monitored and protected. just open land, preserved land. So, I've got 14 acres of swamp in back of my house. So, if it looks like it's going to happen, how soon would do you think the select board would want to see this? If we're if we're discussing taking a CR, holding the CR for it, you know, we've got. Uh, we can do it early December, I think, right? before we get into the whole budget. Uh, ah, yes, that gets hairy. Yeah, budget. January to March is hopeless. So maybe now. <laughs> <laughs> maybe now. Schedule with the select board to do just this. Just show them what's happening and see if they have any objections. I'll bring it up at the board meeting Monday night. We'll get yeah. And uh, and it will. I'm sure that they'll want it to go to legal, too, but there's no point in doing that till it's all otherwise settled and I it's clearly it's still very very draft form. Um, yeah. Yeah. Post, is it? That would be helpful to know yeah. to the roll it in with I don't think the hunting changes anything. It's just a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then so what's your general sense are you are you generally comfortable with it or not not i'm not advocating i, I mean, just want to know <laughs> i would be very comfortable with it you can get away with the the three-year piece on the yeah, i think that's the toughest either problem. that and or well, that, that we that we wind up we go to walk around yeah. here we said five, yeah we Especially if we're going to start with sled load well, there yeah. and have someone else to, you know, keep us on task and maybe point us to go do it. I just yeah. think the important piece yeah. with the cost would be great to roll it in with what we're already yeah. doing. And after, like you said, if we get enough funds, we should be able to cover every three years. Yeah. Whether we get a, money whether we, whether we get a professional person with Lolo or we get funds to cover, I just my my worry is that we have the time and the expertise to do the reports that are needed. Yeah, I I think if with the <clears throat> with the funds that they were offering, which is about sixty four hundred bucks, okay, um, if they put that in a town account like we did with the mitigation funds that are coming from the solar and the landfill, we get money from that could basically all go in the same fund and used to be used to. But I'm just thinking on the three-year piece mm -hmm. there, because we're doing that with our other properties anyways, yeah. so we could be a tack-on fee to that. So we're doing yeah. it anyways, and that's a professional person. So even if Lebo, the merger there falls apart, yeah, it's we still just, we, we would still have all the reports. Yeah, I'm sure that, that um, 
like Pete Westover would be willing to do it. And he charges, this is a big piece, so he might charge $600, but he's not expensive. So. I'm just thinking like down over their money. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, what I'm worried about. The yes. Commission has no money. Yeah, we don't have anything. You know, we have a little tiny three thousand dollars a year for yeah. everything. When they have the budget meeting, we don't even go. Okay. <laughs> well, we, we do to make sure they don't take any more risk. But, but so the, if we come in with a surprise that we're gonna hear from them. So that's yeah. what but, I what I keep on bringing up, you know, how yeah. we're gonna handle it. But we do have a mitigation fund from the landfill, a so. very small one, and we could this could go in that same fund and be used for that purpose. That's essentially yeah. what that's for. Is why my objection was we can't take something on, we can't officially monitor, and the land feels complicated. Yeah. Where is that little piece of? Didn't we get a little piece of land around? There, there? are three little pieces of land. From the land. Um, yeah. yeah. They what they did was They're, they and kind of an odd thing. They used the town vacant land that the town already owned. I'm not sure why. Yeah, I remember because it was that. it's yeah. them who makes the money of it. But anyway. There's a tiny little piece if, next to the town forest on the other side of the scanty. There's a tiny piece, a long strip behind the landfill. Yeah. And there's a third piece somewhere. There's the Rock Road. Your landfill sits here. Yeah. And the things go up in this direction. There's a long oh, skinny sorry. one there. It's, I don't know. Maybe it's only two parcels. Maybe it's My 400 feet right. wide, but it's 5,000 yeah. feet long, if you're right. right. It's yeah. a narrow, long strip. And on the on South Munson, all the houses back up to it, and then Crossroad, you get up to Bennett, and they mark in, and then you have this strip of no man's land. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, I thought one of them was closer to where the proposed fee is. That's why I was asking. Well, the cemetery is right there. The cemetery. Yeah. Right there. We got, I think, the cemetery. The cemetery. Is There's is the old cemetery right is just up the road, and oh, that yeah, that's St. Mary's. It's this, on the other side of the river. Yeah. Yeah. They, so they, well, what they call the old cemetery is way down here, but this is where St. Mary's oh, and, uh, Prospect Cemetery at St. Mary's yeah. is all right there. I actually thought it the bus that property. It doesn't quite. I went and looked. Yeah. There's, there's, oh, it's on the other side of the Scantic, so there's a little piece in between. Little, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not against it as long as we Appreciate financially it. and paperwork wise get it covered. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, if we're, you know, I'll be out there and like I said, I'm happy to have that communication open if it hopefully sure the three year um monitoring schedule would be great. And if you all are able to join for um a year and I'm out there, like I said, if I notice anything on that boundary line. Happy to share that with you. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of just like me telling someone to have Mass Audubon, like a yeah. little like side survey of kind of us enforcing ourselves to one degree. But I think that's beneficial too, is that we're also going to be out there already on that one. Well, one good thing we're at is seeing if someone's land extended, if someone's dumping, if there's APDs. <laughs> yeah. That's well. Yeah, you know, or that's 80% of it. You know, you know. The ones that the land trust monitors, that's that's it. They're erosion, ATVs, um, encroachment by fences or dumping or whatever, um, horses. It's all the same everywhere. And in basics, you know, keeping an eye out for yeah. basics that need to be caught before they blow up and are too big to do anything about it. Long story yeah. short, there's a new solar project coming in on the south. Uh, southwest side of town and the couple times i spoke to the um the site job site manager there they were pulling the hair out with atvs just and they were trying to get fence up to stop them it's hard and this is a big it's, solar project and that's and, kind of a it's, I, I hate to say it's it's, got, it's kind of a political thing at this point i think is that people are exercising freedom yeah. <laughs> and they're like out there they're i mean we one of the power lines that they did a whole area mitigation thing and they fixed up a brook so that the they moved all they moved boulders as big as a Volkswagen to get to be able to cross the stream again. The very stubborn. <laughs> so that's that is always going to be an issue. But I don't think that anybody else has any magical answers for that. It's not yeah. so what's the next step? 
think the next step for us right now is definitely when you all know what that timeline looks like in terms of annual versus every per year monitoring that's doable. And then it sounds like possibly upcoming to the select board to kind of get the same. Yeah, I think for the same exact, maybe not the exact <laughs> monitoring discussion, but the transition about what it is we'll be holding it. We'll They'll be looking at more of the financial, the legal aspects of it than. The monitor. Well, they won't be able to They'll pass that uh, afterwards. <laughs> so then the next step would be going to the select board. Yeah, yeah that's what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. And then getting back to us with any, either any changes they made or any, the, the thing about the three years finalizing the draft is um, got a lot of little details that have to be worked out. So they have to finish all that. And then come back um, to Rose. Yeah, so sometime we'll goes. Our, we'll make changes <laughs> because to our legal and person. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then looking at it again and voting on it. But we can vote that we're comfortable to proceed if we if we make it that way. We have a forum. Yeah, we yeah, now we, have a forum. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, make the most. <laughs> I'll second. All in favor? Aye. And no, no opposition. So we have approved a motion to proceed uh, with getting getting uh, the CR uh, finalized and some details about supervision, about the monitoring. And they will schedule a meeting with the select board because they don't want to be left out. <laughs> Our yeah. Okay. Thank you for coming out of this way. We really appreciate it. Anything else, Don? No. No. No questions? So I just have to go back to Angela's. Okay. <laughs> they went across this today. Thank you. Sure. Oh, sure. It's a public hearing. That's why it's a public hearing. Oh. That's something else. That's Daniel Clay. Great. Okay. Thank you. I have like I'm I'm a private citizen. I'm actually very interested as um I am uh, currently uh, the proud uh, uh, 22 year resident um, facing who well, owns 28 acres facing a 53 acre um, wetlands property that's going to that's the post solar property. And so I'm very interested in um, what you guys are doing and um, just a uh, quick question. Have you been working on this for quite a while? But, and also, do you, do you, are you guys like watchdog people to these developers? And I call them. No, they, they don't have anything to do with oh, you don't have. So <laughs> how did, how did you come to, uh, um, find out about this property to preserve because um, I'm very interested in that because I, I as well, when I built my house 22 years ago, was um, had to follow strict rules involving the box turtle, the spotted salamander, and other wetlands um, uh, uh, endangered species, which is all of the what we're talking about with my property. And a lot of other people's property up on going the floor. Um, so anyway, um, I uh, was just interested in how this, um, when wetlands and conservation beautiful property is coming under such um, uh, what, uh, things going to destroy them. Um, whether it would be for the good of the common good or whatever, um, how do you, how does that come on you guys ready to to uh, preserve it and, and acquire it for uh, the Audubon Society? It can come to us in many many ways. Um, sometimes neighbors call us and say, "Hey, this property's for sale. You should know about it." Uh, we also have maps of. of our sanctuaries and parcels that are around it that we've sort of looked at and our scientists and ecology folks have worked at and we sort of keep an eye on them. 
or I will cold call the the owners just to find out what their plans are depending on the property. Um, and sometimes people will just call us and say, I'm selling my 16 acres and are you interested? Oh, I can serve it. So there's really a lot of ways. ways. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So okay. that, it, and that's how you, you guys do it on the, the Moran's contract with you? Uh, or in that particular case, there was um, a guy in Audubon for a long, long, long time. He wanted to buy the entire parcel, um, but it didn't come up for sale. Uh -huh. But, you know, he had checked in with the land trust and the conservation commission. We knew he was out there. And when it came up, the land trust president called and said, <clears throat> it's up for sale. <clears throat> but he was gone by then. <laughs> And so we ended up notifying them, but it's all part of the same process is that it was one of these properties that was already on their radar because of the other property up the road and it's a big parcel and it's a good bird parcel. Oh, okay. And there's all sorts of things like that about it. But Do you know the mass out of aren't able to afford Pro uh, to property buy. here well? Sold for a very high price. Wow. Laughing Brook, it, it extends in a uh, the Northeast direction along East Brook. And you, Mass Audubon, when I say you, actually own a couple disjointed sections way up on Glendale Road on East Brook. Yeah. So even though it's not, a t you, they own down that line, just like you're gonna get this piece now, you own following that brook up. Mm -hmm. And at the top of that Glendale Road, where East Brook crosses over is where the solar is, so it's not far from where Mass Audubon actually owns the chuck of land. Yeah. Opposite side of the road, half a dozen houses up is this property that they're concerned about. And and what um, <clears throat> we're what we're concerned about <clears throat> the the part on the great job we we they the proposed landowner had his his conservation person go in and of course everything was fine. Well, thank goodness that our town had Brian Bond go in and he had to change the map three times because the wetlands and I I'm a leaf and a butter, so um I'm quite sure they didn't use the GPS uh skirts because well, a lot of flags were were down or for what reason but um, it's um, our our problem is we, we have nine solar fields already in the town for five thousand people, and our problem is this is the proposed solar that is could potentially contaminate water. Trying to get her attention. Thank you. Thank you. Anyways, um. Um, my, uh, sorry, well, there's not much. I mean, it, it's of interest to them, but there's not much they can do. It's a private property, right, right. so yeah. So I, I just not currently for sale unless they decide not to build on. Yeah, it, so. it, 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 it is, and it well, it was. Um, it, the the property has a very interesting and sordid history that I won't bore you with. Um, <laughs> however, um, the wildlife that I see what, and, and here's another thing, like when Godet owned it before the guy bought it last year, we were able to go in and out there and, and nobody, it, it was a kind of a good old neighbor house, you mm. know what I'm saying? Able to go in, like in. Um, it's always hard when yeah. properties that are unmaintained and kind of open, um, um, found, um, um, maintained and open. <laughs> Or, uh, things or old crap, just but beautiful, yeah. beautiful things. And the the hawks that we see, we have an owl, we have a bobcat. Just it just makes my heart sore when I think of all of that wildlife. And so getting to that question, um, um, how do you go about ascertaining? the um, uh, endangered species. There's mapping uh, programs online. It's that we look at because um, National Heritage Endangered Species has mapped pretty much the whole state. Okay. 
So I think it's called Oliver um, Mass Map, or you can go there and kind of drill down to a parcel and, and look at different layers, including. Mm -hmm. I believe the entire community that she's talking about, the whole thing is an HEIP, isn't it? Most of it, yeah. Most of it. Yeah, yeah. most of it. That, that's the Natural um, Heritage and Endangered Species Protection. Oh, yeah. okay. So that so whole property. That's when we got in. Well, it's a whole 17,000 solar. Because it's. I'm just curious. <laughs> just curious. Because, well, in fact, no, their whole property is not. It it ends right at the road. It's one of those things where it just stops at the road. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't go into their but property. I'm sorry. Is, all we did was. Yes. Where the wetlands There's are. Nothing's going in there at this point. Right. We don't know what's going in. Once so they do, once apply. they apply. Yeah. yeah. But then it's then not. But it's actually yeah. not in natural heritage. It's yeah. it's well, we not included. Well, we don't know. Yeah, going. it's interesting. Yeah. That's an absolute fact. Yeah. Um, because we're absolutely yeah. yeah. fact. Yes, okay. it, they remap every uh, three to five years, and I know that somebody from across the road has submitted some turtles they saw on the edge of the property this year, mm -hmm. but that won't go in until the next map, so it doesn't it doesn't count. Um, and it's not under natural heritage. Um, the one thing that we can do is if they're cutting enough trees, then we can get a wildlife assessment. But other than that, there's there's just other small things. We were nothing we're on doing. paper. We had no clue. All we did was figure yeah. out where the edge of the wetlands are. Yeah. They can come to us and say they want to build one house. Yeah. They can come to us and say they want to put an addition on the bar. Yep. Other than that, we have they can't put in as they can't put in a skyscraper because it's not zoned for skyscraper. <laughs> I could put it in storage units. <laughs> no, actually they can't put it, believe it or not, they can't put in storage units and they can't put in they could put in elder housing now. Why not storage units? You you can go in the in the planning board, you can go to the bylaws. Yeah. In the bylaws, there's charts. It's R6. Yeah. And you look up R6 and it says all the things that can be built there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know it's a long drive. And if they, where are you guys from? Oh, wow. That is far. Yeah. <laughs> no, Greenville. Greenville. Yeah. It's a long drive. Be safe. And we will definitely be in touch. Good. Yeah. We'll be in touch very well. I will send you the select board um, email address so that you can, um, that way you can just write them and make what arrangements you need to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes. Careful on 91. Okay. <laughs> oh, we'll be fine. I have a motion to close the meeting. In favor? Aye. Second to both sides. Yeah. Yeah. We have Bill and Cindy. Cindy yeah. usually sits here, yeah. but I was yes. filling Cindy. Hope I wasn't too loud. Uh, oh, yeah. Not.